Uh, good to see you tonight. The camp's on as well, so that takes a lot of folks away, but it's lovely that you're here. We're going to commence our time together with number 33. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight return victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Let's stand together and sing number 33. Those are great words to start our meeting tonight. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let me welcome you as we meet together tonight. I know a number of folks who would normally be here are tied up over at the school. And uh, it's been a good two weeks really for the children and of course the young people this week. And we trust that God will bless the effort that's being made over there again this week but you're very welcome and those who join us live on Facebook and we trust that God will bless us as we meet together don't forget Friday 12 15 the Friday Bible study Corinth the messy church and that of course is with Woody and then this coming Lord's Day 18th of June 10 45 is our prayer meeting preceding our morning service at the breaking of bread and Dave Selwood will be responsible for speaking to the children. And then 5.45, the prayer meeting. 6.30, the gospel meeting. I'll be preaching at both services. I'll tell you something more on Sunday morning about the meeting on Sunday night. So do remember all of those things in your prayers. Now, let's just take a moment quietly as we come to God in prayer and as we just commend ourselves to the Lord this evening. Our gracious Father, we bow in your presence just now on this lovely Wednesday night in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come and we approach you with humility, with gratitude, with hearts that are filled with thanksgiving, and yet at the same time with a real sense of our own unworthiness because we recognize in bowing in your presence, we come to a thrice holy God. You are the one who sits enthroned in the heavens. You have established your throne there for judgment. You are God who is eternal, 
a God who is omnipresent and omnipotent, a God tonight who reigns high above all of creation. And Father, left to ourselves, we dare not and could not come into your presence, but we come in the Savior's name. For Father, we thank you that we are accepted in him. We thank you that we know your Son as our Savior. We thank you, Father, that we stand tonight on redemption ground. And we thank you, therefore, at your invitation, we come just now boldly to the throne of grace. Father, thank you for your kindness and goodness to us again today. Thank you for this spell of weather, our Father, over these past number of weeks. Thank you for the health and strength that enables us to come together just now. And we thank you, Father, for every head bowed in your presence. We come, our Father, to ask simply for your help and for your blessing as we meet around your word tonight. Father, we can say with the psalmist how I love your word, O Lord. We pray that as we come to it just now that you will not only grant to us the help of the Holy Spirit, but that you would open up your word and make it real in the lives of each one of us. Father, so often we come to your word and we just sit and listen and do nothing with it. But we pray that as we learn lessons tonight that are so important for our contemporary world, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will write these things upon our hearts so that we might be the people that we need to be and so that we might always live in a way that is well-pleasing to you. Bless every head bowed in your presence just now and every home represented. We thank you, Father, for those who join with us each Wednesday night and on Sundays on Facebook Live. And we pray, our Father, as they join with us from their own homes, Father, that you would bless them. And for all of us, whatever our individual need, we thank you that you know all about it and you're waiting and willing to minister your grace into every situation. Remember, Father, this week again with the young people, with uh, the football camp, we just thank you for last week and for answer to prayer. We thank you for the good weather this week and for all the young people who have been coming night by night. And we pray that you'll bless these last two nights. And we pray, Father, for Joel as he speaks and for Letitia tomorrow night. Father, that you would just bless the word of God that shared not just with these young people, but also with their parents who come along as well. So, Father, bless us, we pray. Bless that effort as well. Bless those who'd love to be with us but cannot for various reasons. You know all about them, and we just commend them lovingly to you as well. So hear our prayers as we come just now. Bless us as we read and meditate upon your word, and then later as we supplicate the throne of heavenly grace. And all these things we ask in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. Now turn with me, please, back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read again tonight from verse 6. Ephesians 5, and reading from verse 6. The apostle writes, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, 
redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. Last Wednesday night we had begun to look at these verses in Ephesians 5 under the title, Walking in the Light. Of course, Paul at the the beginning of this particular chapter has been instructing and encouraging these believers to walk in love. And he gives them that perfect example of the Lord Jesus Christ so that they might love as he loved and might learn from the example that he showed. But we began to think about what it meant to be walking in the light. And firstly, remember that as God's children, we are to walk as children of light. Paul has been speaking about our character, our conduct, about good and godly speech. And he says that because we have been enlightened through the gospel of God's grace, we're now in Christ, and as far as salvation is concerned, well, really, everything should change. That means we need to walk in the light, and as we walk in the light, a number of things are very clearly evident. Firstly, when we walk in the light, our lives produce good fruit. That's what Paul says here. Look at verses 8 and 9. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 5, our responsibility, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Beloved, when Paul speaks about these three things, these are three fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. Goodness, of course, is a very interesting word. It's used in various ways in the original. But what it simply means for you and I is this. You and I must be people who are good. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ was described as a good man. And you and I are just not as Christians to be good, but we are to also do good unto others. That's not always easy to do. It's not something that is natural to our lives. It's something that the Spirit of God supernaturally has to cultivate in our lives. And beloved, you and I as God's people tonight, you and I must be people who show evidence of God's goodness in everything we seek to do. Secondly, he mentions righteousness, and sufficient to say in passing, because we have thought about this before, Paul speaks about the believer displaying the very righteous character of God in our lives and doing those things that are right before our fellow men. And the third one he mentioned is truth. When you and I walk in the light, do those things that are pleasing to God, and we learn to walk in the truth, then you and I will be people of integrity. We will be people who are real and genuine and so different from the world in which we live, which is so often false and hypocritical. So when we walk in the light, our lives produce good fruit. Secondly, when we walk in the light, we're able to discern what pleases God and what doesn't? Paul says, "You were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world of the Lord. Walk as children of light." Don't ever forget that the Christian life is to be lived for the glory of God. Every motive, every action, it must be pleasing to Him. And if it is not pleasing to God and it's not acceptable to Him, then it ought not to please us. And then, of course, here's the third thing. 
when we walk in the light, our lives produce good fruit. When we walk in the light, we are able to discern what pleases God and what doesn't. And then thirdly, I'm just going to mention this in passing because this is where we left it last week. When we walk in the light, we must expose that which is evil. But beloved, I understand this. Being a Christian in today's world is frowned upon. Anybody and everybody else can do what they like, say what they like, live how they like. But when it comes to the Christian, it's the Christian who has to battle time and time again for the things that they believe in. We are holding on today to Christian values and the world laugh at us. They think the word of God is outdated. They think that standing for the truth and exposing that which is evil is not acceptable. But the word of God reminds you and I tonight that you and I must not only walk in the light do the things that are pleasing to God. But when we see things that are evil and they're influencing our lives and our day and generation, we must be bold enough, truthful enough to speak the truth in love. And we have to expose the evil of our day. Paul says to these people, remember that they were once held in the grip of pagan idolatry. Verse 11, look at what he says. He says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now, when Paul speaks here about the unfruitful works of darkness, you go back in your mind or go back as you read God's word to Ephesians 4, to what he said at the close of Ephesians 4 and what he said in the opening verses of Ephesians 5. And what Paul is simply saying is this. Whenever you walk in the light, the light will always expose that which is evil. And the believer who walks in the light of God's word will not be happy to do things in secret. The believer will not be happy to be in places where evil abounds. You see, there are many believers tonight, and they're not just young people. Sometimes we look at young believers and we say, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't go there, you shouldn't be involved in this. But this goes right up to the oldest of believers. If there are things we know that are not right, we shouldn't be there. If we know that we are in a situation that God would not be happy with, well, we should not be content to be where evil abounds. Because Paul says, remember that as God's children, we are to walk as children of light. Here's the second thing. Remember that as God's children, we are to walk as those who are controlled by the Spirit. Look at what Paul says, verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now let's grasp where Paul's going with this. Walk in love. That's the first exhortation that he gives to these believers. He then says, walk in the light and make sure the lives that you live are well-pleasing to God. And now he says, look, as the children of God, you and I must keep in step with the Holy Spirit and thereby we must live spirit-filled 
now. Now, beloved, this is not only challenging, it gives us an opportunity also just to take a look at ourselves and think about something that is just not biblical, but also very, very practical. You see, the believer in Christ should be someone who is continually filled with the Spirit of God. And the filling of the Spirit will be evidenced in our own going daily walk and in how we worship the Lord together. So let's understand what Paul says here because he highlights four important things. We'll not get them all done, but I know exactly where to stop. So firstly, make sure that your life is consistent and grasp the day of opportunity. That's what Paul says, verse 15 and 16. He puts it like this. He says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now those words take us back again to verse 8 that Paul has already mentioned when he says, for ye were sometimes darkness. And Paul, of course, to their mind, is taking them back to that place where they were prior to their conversion. Pagans, steeped in idolatry, engaged in every type of sin. Paul says, look, that's what you used to be. But now you're the children of God. You're to walk in love. You're to walk in light. And you're to walk as children who are spirit-filled. You see, Paul is saying simply to these believers, since the grace of God, the grace of God has brought you out of the deadness and the darkness of your sin, since now as God's children, you walk in the light as you imitate him. Make sure you take heed to your Christian walk and to your behavior as a Christian in a dark world. See then that ye walk circumspectly. Now, some people might say, well, what on earth does that word circumspectly mean that Paul uses here? Well, the word circumspectly is an old English word. And it's a very interesting word, and it certainly underlines everything that Paul says to these people. It comes from two Latin words. It literally means looking around, looking around. And in the context of what Paul says here, Paul is saying to these believers, look, Look around you at the world in which you live and walk carefully. Look at the world in which you're living where God has called you and God has set you to be a witness for his son and a witness for the gospel. Look at the world in which you live and a better word is walk with exactness. Make sure your life is everything God expects it to be. I love it when you and I became Christian. We just didn't live as we please. That's one of the greatest downfalls today in the Christian church with people, many of them who professed faith and after a short time walked away from the Lord to do their own thing. Now I'm sorry, but if a believer is genuinely saved, it is possible to feel, it is possible to fall, but you're not going to stay there 20, 30 years when you know you're not in the place where God wants you to be. You walk according to the principles of God's word. That's what it means to be a Christian. You watch your step, every step. You walk wisely in a dark world. Let me simplify that by saying this. Firstly, Paul's saying take good care as to how you walk. You see, when you go out every day to live your life, don't just idly try to get through life. Be consistent in everything you do as a Christian. That's every day. Many of us are consistent in what we do on a Sunday. We long for a Sunday to come so we can meet together in fellowship with other believers. We can worship together. We, we have a good Sunday. But the Christian is to be a Christian Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
Saturday until the next Sunday and it starts all over again. Because every single day Paul says, look, don't just try to idly get through life. Don't be the kind of Christian who says, well, I'm saved now and I can't wait to get home. And I'll, 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 you'll what? You'll struggle through life. Paul says, don't do that. You've got a life, you need to live it, and when you live it, live it every day for the glory of God. Secondly, it means that we're not to be foolish in our outlook to life. Every Christian should have a plan and a purpose for life. And we should maximize every opportunity to live out our faith. And thirdly, it means to live a balanced life, a balanced life. Even though we may not know what a day will bring forth, this is the day of opportunity for us and we must make the best use of our time. And Paul says there's a reason for that. He says, grasp these opportunities, make the best use of your time because the days are evil. The days are evil. Now, to understand what Paul has in his mind here when he uses this statement, especially after saying, see that you walk circumspectly. Remember, Paul is speaking at a time when for the Christian church, these were difficult days. These were days when believers were under persecution. Persecution was rife. Yes, opportunities were given. Privileges were extended. But the day was coming, Paul says, we'll not have them. You're not going to have the opportunity. You're not going to have the privileges that you have now. And in Paul's day, persecution, distress, discouragement threatened the Christian church on every side. By the use of the word time here in the original, Paul has a special time in his mind. He's not just talking about time and sense. Paul says to them, listen, this is a crucial time. This is a critical time, and it's a day of opportunity. And Paul says you need to be wise as you live out your faith. You need to strike when the iron is hot. You need to do all that you can, because very soon there's a wind of change is going to blow through, and your opportunities will be gone, and gone for good. I don't think that any one of us either here in this building or sitting at home on Facebook Live, would deny tonight that as far as the Christian church is concerned, and as far as the world in which we live is concerned, these are days of sweeping change too. But beloved, these are also days of opportunity, depending how you look at these things. And if these are days of opportunity for the gospel, we cannot let these days pass in our day and generation for they may not come this way again. We don't know how soon the tide will turn in this land. We don't know how quickly the doors of opportunity will close. We don't know how much more difficult it will become for us to nail our colors to the mast and be a Christian. You and I live in a world where Christian things no longer matter. Do we not already see evidence of these things all around us? We've seen in recent years the demise of many open-air meetings. Because communities want nothing to do with the gospel. I remember in a previous church, we did it every year when I was there. We did it every summer. Once a week going out into a different part of the community. And one night two were standing at the microphone singing and the police car pulled up at the back of me. I knew the policeman. He didn't want to be there. But someone across the road happened to be out and heard us and knew we were Christians, phoned the police and said, I want you to move them. That's a number of years ago. The policeman said to me, Really, I would rather not be doing this, but you're going to have to pack. I says, I'll be finished in 10 minutes. Finished the meeting and went. Changed to a new location. Couldn't do it there either. Too near the house. 
Beloved, this is already happening in our generation. We see schools across our nation removing the school assembly. Religious education from their curriculum. And now we have our Secretary of State now imposing another regulation upon our schools. Where Christian school teachers may be asked to speak about the LBGT plus community. And then they have to teach the children about sex before marriage and how to have an abortion. Now, I'm saying this tonight as the pastor of this church. I would say to every young couple who have children at school or those who are Christian teachers who are going to confront this at school that you say to the headmaster, you won't do it. And you'll write to the board of governors and say to them, I'm sorry, but as a Christian, I can't be involved in this. And ask like other religions have done in the past that your children be excused put to another safe place in the school and wait until this is over. Other religions have done it for years and nobody said anything. I'll guarantee you that when Christians say that and Christian teachers say, I can't do this, it'll be a matter of employment. That's the world we live in. We see churches on the decline numerically. And sadly, spiritually, as people either die and are not replaced or people just simply depart from the faith, the cost is too great. We see believers who are far more interested in this life than they are in the life that is yet to come. Now, beloved, this is not all doom and gloom. Let me say this. I believe with all my heart that across our world tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ is building his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Doesn't mean they'll not try. Doesn't mean that you and I will not be caught up in the aftermath. But in our land and in lands across the sea, so richly blessed as far as the gospel is concerned, times are changing. The church to a large extent is sleeping. They've never had to approach this before in our generation. Everything has been freedom. You do what you like as a church. You go out and preach what you like. That is changing. Standards are declining. The levers are drifting. The work is suffering. And the spirit is grieving. Beloved, these are our days of opportunity and none of us know how swiftly they're going to pass us by. You say, Pastor, well, what should that mean for us tonight as believers in this church? Simply this. That first of all, as a church, we need to be on our knees in prayer. That's the first thing. The problem is that so many believers today don't come to pray. But when it's their job at stake or when it's their child in this position, they'll come and they'll say, Pastor, would you get the church to pray? Why? Come and pray yourself. Come and pray for our children. Come and pray for our young people. Come and pray for the Spirit of God to move in mighty power. Come and do it now, for the day of opportunity will soon be gone. The second thing is this. We need to grasp our opportunities. They might be coming less and less, but we need to grasp them, beloved, because, listen, we need to redeem the time. One of these days, God will take me home. What I've done over all these years will be gone in a flash. And it's the same for you. The last thing any one of us want to do is to waste the time. And sitting at home and say, well, I can't do this. I won't do that for the days are evil. It's because the days are evil that we do it. It's because the time is short that we do it. And it's because we still have the opportunity that we do it. Because we never know how soon this might all come. To a close for our generation. 
Paul says, firstly, make sure that your life is consistent and grasp the day of opportunity. See then that you walk circumspectly, Paul says, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Secondly, make sure that you're living in the center of God's will. Look at what Paul says, verse 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And Paul says to these believers, look, since you know that these things are true, for you can see the evidence of it all around us, then not only grasp the opportunity, don't only redeem the time, discern the will of God for your life. Because these are critical days. While you've got the opportunity, seek to fulfill the will of God. And I believe for us to hear that, to understand that, to do nothing about that would not only be a great neglect, but be thought. Well, but this is so challenging for every one of us. Because the fact is that very often when we start out in the Christian life and sometimes when we drift our way through the Christian life, we have no plan, no purpose for our lives. And it seems outwardly for many believers today, they're not really concerned about the will of God for their lives. I love the writing of Paul David Tripp. I didn't even know who he was until the man that I met and I knew his brother came over and he was living in Vancouver and I met him for coffee one day a number of years ago and he gave me a book. He said, you ever hear of that man? I said to him, is him? No. And he says, you read that. It was a book of daily readings. I never was as blessed and challenged as I was with that particular book. But Paul David Tripp has written well over a dozen books on the Christian life alone. Very challenging, extremely practical. This is what he says about the Christian life. Everything that was created was made by God and for God. All the glories of this created world were designed to point to his glory. The universe is his designed to function according to his plan and purpose, that includes you and me. That includes you and me. See, sometimes we look at the weather and we look at all the things around us and we think, my God created all of this. God created you too. God created me. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. For we're made in the image of God. David Tripp goes on to say this. We were not made to live independent, self-directed lives. We were not made to exist according to our own little self-oriented plans or to live for our moments of glory. We were created to live for him. Now that's a great challenge, isn't it? Whenever you and I, and even before you and I were ever born, God had a purpose for our lives. He still has. And God wants us, look, to pray about his will for our lives, to seek out his will for our lives, and to live out our lives in the center of his will. Remember Paul, this man who was a Judaizer, if you like, to the backbone, persecuted the church, consented to Stephen's death. In other words, go on ahead and do it. And then he was spoken to on the Damascus road when a light shone from heaven. And this man was converted to Jesus Christ and the believers then were almost afraid of him because all they knew was what Paul had done. They couldn't grasp what he had become. Then Paul in the midst of everything, asks the question of his God, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life? Paul says, God showed him. 
And God told him, and he went out to be a missionary and a man who would bring the gospel to the Gentiles. It cost him his life. He was in the will of God. He did what God asked him to do. And it cost him his life. Now, not just his life with regards to time and talents and travel and all the things we know about his three missionary journeys, it cost him his life and death. Can you imagine that? Here's a man in the center of God's will. And you read what he says to the Corinthians when he talks about how that he was beaten and shipwrecked, 39 stripes on his back, and he goes through this long list of things. And he was at the center of God's will. Beloved, being in the center of God's will doesn't mean it's going to be an easy journey. It doesn't mean we're going to just sail home quietly to heaven. I know knowing the will of God sometimes is very difficult. Because God deals with us individually and God deals with us all differently. But he really does want us to understand his will and to do it. That's why when you come to read the scriptures and you come in particular to books like the Psalms and you'll hear David praying, Lord, lead me. Lord, guide me. There's a reason for that. David, like everybody else, had a difficult life. We mentioned on Sunday past, trials, temptations, tragedies. But he continually said, Lord, what do you want to do with me? Lead me, guide me, teach me. Believe it or not, God wants to guide us. God wants to bless us so that in these days that are evil, when we have the opportunity, he might bless others through us. And God wants to fulfill his plan and his purpose through our life. I know it's difficult to discern, but it has to be said there are many believers tonight just not interested in what God's plan and purpose might be. Paul would disagree with them. He says, firstly, make sure that your life is consistent. Grasp the day of opportunity. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Secondly, make sure that you're living in the center of God's will. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And thirdly, this is where we'll pick it up next time. Make sure that your life is spirit controlled. It's a big, vast subject. This is the last tonight, by the way, of our Bible studies as such. Next week, 8 to 9, and then we've got a, a members meeting, and then we're into the summer break. But we will pick it up here because what Paul says about a spirit-controlled life leads us right through the home, right into warfare, and all these other things that we'll think about, God willing, in weeks and months to come. Let's bow together for a moment in prayer. Father, we bow quietly and humbly. We're so thankful, first of all, that the Lord Jesus Christ is building his church. Right across our world tonight, people are getting saved. Churches are being established. But our Father, the work is never easy in a world where Christians today seem to be in many places in the minority and under attack. So as your children, our Father, we pray that you would help us to redeem the time, to grasp the opportunities while we have them, for the days are evil. And our Father, it might change, but it might change for the worst and perhaps even sooner than we think. So help each one of us with the lives you've given to us, the talents that you've given to us. Help us, Father, to discern the will of God. 
and help us to fulfill your plan and your purpose for each one of us. So we thank you for what we've learned thus far. We commend ourselves to you. Pray that your word will continue to help and be a blessing for us. In Jesus' name, amen.